It's a city of sports and of music, baseball and rock and roll, football and rock and roll, hockey and basketball and rock and roll because of the nature of the town. It's been a city that has always enjoyed its fun. And in some ways, the Dropkicks are kind of what Boston's all about. The last 86 years of futility, of the inevitability of loss, um, not being able to figure out exactly when it was going to happen, but we knew it was going to happen, um, had, uh, had a variety of impacts on this city and this region. Yankees and Red Sox are playing. Everybody's on our bus. You know, we were supposed to be on stage like two hours early, and the club owner kept coming out. If this band wants to watch baseball, they shouldn't book a tour during baseball season. It's like, hey, pal, we didn't think we'd be in game seven. You know, we used to lose in every year, you know? We're not having a family emergency, not getting ready to play the show. We're sitting in our bus watching the baseball game. We're not getting on stage until that game is over. Then they lose they lose again and we got to get on stage and Ken was on his knees in front of the TV and I was like you gonna make it and he goes I don't know if I can do this I remember I think we played two songs and Kenny grabbed the microphone looked up at the ceiling and just blurted out it's just not fair it's just not fair I don't believe in any curses I mean the curse um, and it actually goes back to Babe Ruth Ownership and the front office. I mean, the management. That was the Red Sox curse was that they, their ownership was usually inferior to the Yankees. Tessie was an old song uh, from uh, Broadway uh, back at the turn of the last century. Um, and in 1903, uh, it became an anthem for the. Um, the ardent Red Sox fans, they weren't actually the Red Sox yet, but the fans of the Boston American League Club called the Royal Rooters. The Royal Rooters were like the original Red Sox nation, I guess. They were like, you know, the rowdy fan base, you know, the diehard supporters of the team. They would go to travel to away games in large groups, just drinking and being rowdy and singing songs. and Scally caps, top hats, drinking down in Mission Hill and Roxbury. And then they'd just make their way up Huntington Ave. And, and in the old days in the fence, they used to stand on the sidelines where the third base and first base lines are. And they'd just be right on top of the players, you know. Uh, and, and these guys were just to the extreme loyalist for the, for the Boston club. The team didn't have a lot of money in the world to get the band playing at the games anymore. And that's when they started just singing. And Tessie was this Broadway song that uh, I don't know why they picked that one, but they started singing it at the games. And so uh, they took this piano bar Broadway song and uh, started singing it over and over, even changing the words to, um, to chide the visiting outfielders. They were trying to be obnoxious. They were trying to you know, drive people from New York and Pittsburgh crazy, and they did a really good job of it. 20 years later, Hannes Wagner, when asked about the old three World Series, said, I hate that song. I hate that song. Um, he didn't forget, and we didn't either. That basically seems to be it. It's like they stopped fervently supporting the Sox, and then the Sox stopped winning the uh, World Series. I mean, it's not maybe you know, it's very it's a very superstitious thing. But then again, Boston sports fans have always been extremely superstitious. When you have a song that played a role, an undeniable role, historians all agree in the uh, Boston club's first world championships, um, that shouldn't go extinct. The Red Sox organization wanted to bring back the song Tessie because of its, uh, its, its properties for helping win World Series and what have you. I had heard of the song, uh, but I hadn't heard it. Um, and when the Red Sox were headed for the uh, 2003 postseason play, I thought, wow, to commemorate the 100th anniversary, let's find it. 
And uh, in October of 2003, we found it on the internet and it was a very scratchy recording. Um, and it was too scratchy to play in the ballpark. So at least I had found it, but I didn't quite know what I was gonna do with it. Peter Gamins and I have been, uh, for the last five years, been hosting a, a charity concert for the Jimmy Fund at the Paradise called Hot Stove Pro Music. The Dropkicks played at our show uh, back in January in 2004. It was a couple of weeks later, spring training opens up in Fort Myers, Florida, and I'm talking to Charles Steinberg, the executive vice president of public affairs for the Red Sox. I'm sitting here with a scratchy recording of Tessie, and I want a modern version of it. He took it to the band, and uh, they played it and had a laugh. Right off the bat, I was I was in. I didn't care if it was you know a good good bad idea. It, that didn't make any difference. It was like the Red Sox were asking for something for us, and I wanted to do it. Jeff Horrigan emailed an MP3 of the, of Tessie, the old you know the old 1903 version of it, and and when I heard that, I immediately said, I'm out. It was from I think it was from an acetate. It was just really poorly recorded and like scratchy. And I was sitting down and Kenny hit play and it was like Tessie is a maid with a hockey and I, I you really could not hear a word. Tessie is a maiden with a sparkling eye. Tessie is a maiden with a love. You could barely make out what was going on in the recording. It was like what sounded like a 400 pound old lady singing like in her parlor in Beacon Hill or something, you know, about her parrot. It was, it was horrible. The original version of Tessie um, is about as awful as anything I've ever heard. So we had a hard time at first with this Tessie, Tessie tune, just trying to make it into anything that would remotely sound like us, first of all, and be, be, an, appeal, be an appealing anthem. I was expecting a remake. Eventually, we said to Jeff Oregon, you know, if we're gonna do this song, we need to update it. We need to make it about something cooler than this. Uh, let's make it about that whole era of the Royal Rooters. I, what I ended up doing was taking the story of the Royal Rooters and how they used Tessie. And so, you know, it ended up being a song about a song. And, you know, I, I thought Ken would think it was ridiculous. You know, I didn't know anything about the, the history of it at the time, so he, he kind of worked on most of the lyrics. You know, from there he ended up with, I guess, the modern day version of Tessie, which we tried to keep having some of that old time feel by like keeping the piano on it and that stuff. So I think it, I think it still has a little bit of an old fashioned feel to it. What was ironic was the Dropkicks were not only a good band to do it, they were the right band to do it. And I explained this is a band that has taken Irish traditional music, given it a kick in the ass and, and you know, amped it up and, and turned Irish songs into punk songs. If I had uh, known there was such a band that did that, I might have looked all over the world for such a band and naturally they're here in your own backyard. So it fit perfectly that it's the Dropkicks because um, this is an old song sung by a lot of Boston Irishmen in 1903 and uh, maybe they sang it to their grandchildren but it faded away. Charles is awesome. I mean, he's a guy, he just he gets it, you know, he knows that he knows that it needed to be a local band to do the song. He, he was really a big backer of the whole thing uh, of, of having us involved. We booked some studio time down near Fenway and we were told a couple players were going to come over and help out on the song. The story I heard was that Bronson, Arroyo, and Lenny Donato were all, you know, cool to do it. And... What am I going to say? No, uh, that's insane, you know. Of course, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely go in there and, you know, I'm not, I don't think I'm the greatest singer in the world, but I'll definitely get in there and do my best. You know, I wasn't really sure what to expect because I've never done kind of the recording process. I didn't know how... Uh you know, in detail they were gonna get. And, and you know, lucky for, for me and Lenny, it was just kind of like we were singing in the background and it was a bunch of people singing and it was not that big of a deal. Here's these two guys that, you know, can come out of the, the bullpen in front of 35, 38,000 people at Fenway. You know, you gotta have nerves of steel to be able to do that, but you know, that they're, they're nervous that they're gonna screw up when it comes to doing music and I just find that funny, you know. Mark isn't the most tactful person at times and I, 
he was like picking up maracas and stuff and giving them to the players like, hey, maybe you should come on and play these things, you know, play them like you need it. So you get your stuff going like this. Right. I'm going to listen to it. I don't know how, how, how the rhythm would go. I actually picked up uh, some maracas and, and they were trying to give me a maraca lesson during the shoot too. I was just trying to get a good feel for them to, you know, just like be comfortable. There's like all these news cameras around here, like, hey, sing, you know what I mean? So uh, I was like, uh, you know, I'll like, you know, make them feel comfortable. Pretend they're not even there, you know? So I got like maracas. I'm like, let's rock out, dude. If he was on the baseball field with me, I'd totally give him a glove and a ball and be like, here, throw the curveball like this, and it'd be the same. Listening to the headphones, everybody's listening to you, and it, it becomes a little weird because it's not our comfort zone, you know? Just like if. You know, we take the guys out and say, hey, let's take some BP. They, they might be able to hit okay, but you get out there on the field and everybody's watching, and there's Manny Ramirez, and next thing you know, you're really swinging and missing at everything, you know? And so I was standing outside the studio <clears throat> waiting to get started, and a guy comes out, and he's, like, clearing off space on the sidewalk, and I was like, what's up? He goes, oh, we're making room for Johnny's bike. And I was like, Johnny who? Around the corner, comes ripping around, a bunch of kids following him. Johnny Damon comes right up on the sidewalk. Gets off, pulls off his helmet. He's like, come on, man, let's do this. I was like, Johnny Damon's it. It was a real, you know, Boston Pride vibe or whatever, you know. It was, uh, it was pretty intense stuff, you know. Every time I would be explaining to people this song, they're going, who is Tessie? You know, and you're trying to say, well, who is this parrot that the woman used to sing to? And people are just like, what? So I said, we need, we need a Tessie. You know, to get our our hooks into this whole project more. We needed, Tessie needed to become physically somebody, you know what I mean? When we got to the Red Sox, uh, those of us who joined the club in 2002, one of the things we did, again, to honor traditions in baseball, was to have uh, a young lady sweep the bases after the fifth inning. So Colleen Riley, who has a wonderful personality and deals with fans beautifully, uh, was my choice to uh, sweep the bases and the uh, she wore an old-fashioned uh, uniform from a league of their own. I was uh, introduced to the drop kicks because a meeting I had overlapped with a meeting they were having with Charles Steinberg. And he said, oh, this is the girl that sweeps the bases. And they said, oh, we're a fan. And it was, I was very flattered. So the drop kicks asked her uh, to be um, Tessie in the video. And it's like you can't have, you know, a rock video without the, without the rock chick and she was the, the baseball chick for a baseball video. I mean, they made me feel very comfortable. Imagine the scenario, you know, throw on a wool dress, it's 90 degrees out, um, stand in the middle of this rock band and dance around and tours are going through. Oh yeah, and you're also at the ballpark. And then when it came time to dance on the dugout, totally different day, ran down there, it's just Ken, the band's not there. She really kind of gave the video life and, you know, a spark. And then really, as the thing progressed, became like, you know, Tessie, like, that's who she is, Tessie. And I mean, my three-year-old daughter, like, you know, when I take her to games, all she does is look for Tessie. Only a team that calls themselves the Idiots would have a punk band doing their, their, their song, you know, for the year, so. I think we were the perfect band to do it because we we're fans of, of the team. No, there's no bullshit with the Dropkick Murphys. They're just uh, regular guys, and that's what Boston's about. You always tell our players who are new to the area, just play hard. You know, play your ass off, and they'll like you. And you know, just don't make excuses. Do your job. Do everything you can to win. Get dirty, and, and, and you'll fit in great in Boston. That's kind of the same way the Dropkicks are as a band. So it's a good, good fit. Dropkicks are huge baseball fans. I'm a huge music fan, and just to be able to go out and do what you love to do and, and be able to please the people of Boston is an incredible feeling. So and we take pride in what we do. They're just like everyday guys, you know. It's kind of simil similar to how, um, you know, the Red Sox locker room has been. We've got a bunch of kind of roughneck guys that just hang out and are, are everyday guys, you know. They go to a bar, have a beer, and hang out with some people. The Red Sox also espouse that sort of every man regular Joe kind of ethic, you know, I mean, look at those guys, they look like a bunch of friggin' construction workers, you know? The Dropkick Murphys, they're the same bunch of guys, you know, they're a bunch of blue-collar guys, they sing about, you know, America, they sing about uh, the, the fight for organization, and, and that's the way I think your basic Red Sox fan is. I guess if you're, if you're, if you're true to yourself and to, and to your, your, the boys in the band or, or, or the team, and, you know, to your fans, 
hey, it, you know, who knows how far he can go. I can't believe you guys let us be a part of this whole thing, and uh, I can't believe I'm standing on the field and we just won the World Series. Unbelievable. A Unbelievable. Year, a year ago this time, do you think you'd be here? Anything involved with the Red Sox? No, I didn't, even, I, I didn't think the Red Sox would be here. I didn't think I'd be here. I didn't think. It's just, it's like, uh, I can't, it's hard to imagine right now, you know? People who talked about curse and all these silly notions said it will never be the same. Well, they were wrong. Um, it just grew people closer to the Red Sox. You know what? We don't have to listen to that curse. We don't have to listen to 1918. The way they came back and just, with all guns firing, just came back and just destroyed the Yankees. I think if the curse isn't broken now, it never will be. I, people, they, you have to get over it, you know? I'm fully a believer that this helped reverse the curse. Uh, we brought back a song that was associated with the first five world championships that disappeared and so did the world championships, reappeared and we won the world championship. You figured out. Nothing that we've ever done is, is gonna be like a bigger deal than being involved with the years that the Red Sox broke the curse. Tessie is the royal root is rally cry. Tessie is the tune they always sung. Tessie echoed April through October nights after serenade installed the name in yard. Tessie is a maiden with a sparkling eye.